Hi, I'm actor Ian Champion, and welcome to History of Horror Cinema, my podcast series devoted to the good, bad, and the ugly of horror movie history. Please don't forget to like what you hear and hit subscribe. I have such sights to show you. The Cat and the Canary, 1927 Following the success of his expressionist film Waxworks in 1924, director Paul Lenny was invited to Hollywood to direct at Universal Studios by Carl Lemley. His first film there was The Cat and the Canary, based on John Willard's play, which was released in the same year of Fritz Lang's masterpiece Metropolis, that would bring expressionism to a close. Lenny's Hollywood calling card is an entertaining chiller reminiscent of Agatha Christie, and played more for light-hearted spooky fun instead of serious horror. A group of needy relatives gather at the mansion of the deceased millionaire Cyrus West for the reading of his will. There is no love lost between him and them. My relatives have watched my wealth as if they were cats, and I a canary. Consequently, he bequeaths his entire estate to the most distant and least vulture-like Annabelle West, Laura Laplante, including the priceless West Diamonds. There is, however, a vital codicil imposed, which is that a doctor must verify the benefactor to be of proven sound mental health if the estate is passed to the named person in the solicitor Mr. Crosby's envelope. West supposedly added this as revenge upon his relatives for cruelly doubting his own sanity while he was alive. We suspect skullduggery from the prologue due to remarkably modern use of point-of-view camera work that shows a corrupt, unknown person adding an amended will to the safe. This is coupled with an effective double exposure technique depicting West cowering before the giant predatory moggies representing his presuming heirs. Another nice touch is the same layering of images when we see the grandfather clock's inner chimes working for the first time, overlaid upon the tense family gathering at the table to hear the will reading. Stylistically, The Cat and the Canary benefits greatly from Lenny's background in painting and set design mixing the multi-turreted castle and atmospheric sets of expressionism with a mainstream Hollywood sensibility. Amongst the acquisitive family are Paul Jones, a lily-livered but decent comic relief in Harold Lloyd glasses, played by Creighton Hale, a veteran of D.W. Griffith's films, West's nephews, Harry Blythe, Arthur Edmund Carew, Charles Wilder, his sister Susan Silsby, Flora Finch, and her niece Cecily Young, Gertrude Astor. There is also Manny Pleasant, the family housekeeper, who blames the new will on the ghostly hand of Cyrus from beyond the grave. The family opt to stay the night, a good night's sleep scuppered when a guard appears, warning them that an escaped lunatic is on the prowl, last seen around the premises. He's a maniac who thinks he's a cat and tears his victims like they were canaries. The scene is set for the unknown identity of the envelope name, who is aware of his position, Annabelle is told by Crosby before he is bumped off, to try to scare Annabelle into an unhinged state that will pass the inheritance to them. Annabelle is told in a secret note of the diamond's hiding place, but on wearing them in necklace form in bed, they are stolen by a grotesque, claw-like hand, casting a Nosferatu-like shadow over her before stealing them. None of the other relatives believe her, nor can they accept it when Paul is grabbed by the same evil hand and pulled back through a secret bookcase passage as Annabelle looks on in horror. While the cast gradually flee in terror or to seek help, Paul re-emerges to fight off the hideously ugly attacker of Annabelle, whose claw hand we've already witnessed. He is a terrible sight, saber teeth projecting up from his bottom jaw and with an oversized left eye into the bargain. The climactic grapple reveals him to be Charlie Wilder in disguise, the hidden benefactor of Crosby's envelope, that had disappeared before anyone could label him as chief suspect. He was in league all along with the guard to gaslight Annabelle into constructive insanity. Annabelle is the safe, rightful heir after all, and with Paul as her new love will take up the inheritance of the mansion. Lenny's film became highly influential upon future horror plots, being remade a number of times as the classic Haunted House staple plot, including with Bob Hope in 1939. Lenny would go on to direct one more classic, The Man Who Laughs, with expressionist star Conrad Veidt before his tragically young death from sepsis in 1929 at the youthful age of 44. 
The Man Who Laughs, 1928. Having had such great success with horror films inspired by literary classics, Universal wanted Carl Lemley to produce another, and after securing Lenny to come over and direct The Cat and the Canary, they teamed up again and turned to Victor Hugo, the author of The Hunchback of Notre Dame for more sensational source material. Because of Lemley's German heritage, he was able to secure famed expressionist actor Conrad Veidt to play Gwynplaine, the disfigured, mocked hero reminiscent of Hugo's Quasimodo in The Man Who Laughs. The original intention was to star Lon Chaney, but his contract by now was with MGM. The resulting film is a melodrama, yet features enough dark elements to be seen also as a part of horror cinema history. Set in 17th century England, the story begins with Gwynplaine's father, a nobleman Lord Clancharley, who falls foul of King James II, thus resulting in being tortured in an Iron Maiden while his son's face is grotesquely deformed by royal surgeon Dr. Hardquanon into a permanent ghoulish smile. The boy wanders, now fatherless, through a snowstorm, but upon discovering a blind baby, D, left abandoned, the two are taken in by a mountebank sideshow entertainer, Ursus, played by Cesare Gravina. He also owns a talented German shepherd, who unfortunately, due to being named after the Latin for man, earns the reproval, Be quiet, homo, upon alerting him to the children. As he grows to adulthood, Gwynplaine becomes a travelling actor of sorts for Ursus, in shows that capitalize on audiences' curiosity about the laughing man. Hear how they laugh at me. Nothing but a clown. He and D, Mary Philbin, Esmeralda in The Hunchback, have grown to love each other, and without being able to see his face, she does not know about his disfigurement. Later she tells him that she was denied sight, so that she would not be distracted from the goodness within him. Veidt is allowed to give a startling yet sympathetic portrayal, those expressive, pained eyes at odds with the etched, macabre grin he is forced to wear, like Pagliacci condemned to spread joy while he is dying of heartache inside. For the part, as Cheney suffered so admirably in his roles, Veidt had to wear a special bracket that stretched his mouth, while also displaying ugly teeth into a love-that-joker expression that has inspired many film portrayals of a more genuinely twisted evil than his facially imprisoned innocent. When Queen Anne hears of him, her evil jester Barkil Fedro uncovers the performer's true lineage as being the rightful heir of her throne. She decrees that, since his father's estate is now owned by her daughter, Duchess Josiana, they must marry to restore his rightful place. Once made a peer in the House of Lords, Gwynplaine is stung by the cruelly mocking laughter as he stands, ermine-clad, smiling helplessly at the other peers. He turns his tears into triumph, ferociously rejecting the royal decree to marry, and upon fleeing the house in a swashbuckling sword-fight climax, he escapes England on a boat with Dee, Ursus, and their valiant dog. Veidt would later go on to achieve acclaim in America himself after fleeing Nazi Germany, most famously as Major Strasse in that perennial favorite Casablanca, before his untimely death at age 50. Thanks for listening. And if you like what you've just heard, don't forget to click so, and please hit subscribe. If you build it, they will come.